On the 12th of August, 2017, we took off. After having driven 7,000 kilometers from Montreal to Whitehorse, then another eight hours on dirt roads to this remote lake, we were bursting with an abundance of enthusiasm. The four of us in a rickety 1950s beaver soared 200 kilometers deep into the expansive wilderness over the endless stunted spruce of the northern boreal forest, then unclimbed peaks and pristine glaciers over the Yukon border and into Nahani National Park of the Northwest Territories. From the air, we got our first taste of euphoria with a glimpse of what we had been dreaming of for months, the mighty granite spires that form what is known as the Cirque of the Unclimbables. We touched down on Glacier Lake, and from here, only a short but grueling hike up into the Alpine separated us from the fairy meadows and granite towers. Hundreds of kilometers from roads, and even further from our worries, we prepared ourselves for an adventure. Camping in the shadows cast by the granite cathedrals, we waited for the towers to offer us suitable conditions to venture upwards. Our objective was the Lotus Flower Tower, a world-renowned alpine climb, known as much for its aesthetic purity as for its perfect rock and high-quality climbing. After nearly two weeks of wading out rain and snow in the lush alpine meadows, passing the time playing on the boulders, reading books and drinking tea, and after a first attempt had already been thwarted by abnormally low sub-zero temperatures on the wall, we finally got the short weather window we needed to head up the great buttress for a second time. Leaving camp at three in the morning, under a display of the Aurora Borealis, we hiked through boulder fields to the base of the tower and made it 90 meters up the wall before sunrise, first ascending the ropes we had fixed a few days earlier, then leaving easy terrain by headlamp. Fingers frozen and hearts glowing, we climbed instinctively up the grassy cracks as quick as we could. Dawn gave way to day, and the sun warmed the rock as we gained a system of wide chimneys. We wiggled our way up for a few hundred meters, and the ground gave way beneath us, boulders turning to pebbles, air all around. The chimneys brought us to the bivy ledge, a small piece of alpine meadow, lush moss, wild flowers and all, sat perched here, 400 meters up the wall. Although a night spent here could have lent us supreme satisfaction, the mountains had granted us only one day and not two. We were climbing against time, knowing full well of the possibility of the weather degrading with the progression of the day.
A steep dihedral was the beginning of the more difficult climbing. The monolithic headwall towered above us, split by several sets of parallel cracks that ran upwards for a continuous 300 meters like train tracks. Large crystals of feldspar and intrusive black basalt knobs provided footholds as we danced our way upwards, cautiously but surely, on the climbing wall made by the gods. Lead after lead, we moved up the great line towards the sky. The perfect finger cracks became perfect hand cracks, and we jammed our way up higher. Continuous high-quality climbing lulled us into a subdued serenity. The wall became steeper, passing through overhanging bulges, and we found ourselves on an airy, vertical granite highway. The buttress, only 40 meters across, pointed upwards. As we approached the summit, clouds swelled in from below and swallowed us, forcing us to climb the last few pitches under falling snow. Stranded on a surreal granite pillar, lost in the clouds, we pushed up the flower of stone. We summited at 9 p.m. after 16 hours on the wall. The view from the summit was a wall of whiteness just beyond the tips of our noses and conditions continued to worsen. After a short moment of celebration and profound gladness, we began the 17 rappels down into darkness, first through snow, then rain, finally getting off the wall nearly five hours later, just after 1.30 a.m. But the slog back to our sleeping bags wasn't over. The rain had mostly subsided, but the entire valley floor had become engulfed in thick fog and visibility limited to only a few meters by headlamp. With great difficulty, we retraced our steps through the talus fields, hopping boulder to boulder towards our camp in the meadows, arriving just before dawn. Exhausted, but deeply satisfied, we fell into a deep, dreamless sleep under the spell of the lotus. <laughs>